All right, and welcome everybody to the B&H virtual event space. Today we have Sony Artisan of Imagery, Tony Gale, back with us for part three of his series, The Business of Photography. Today, Tony's gonna to be talking about uh, pricing and estimating. So a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's event, Sony. So with that, Tony, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Danny. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I am a Sony Artisan of Imagery, as Danny just said. And as he just said, this is the business of photography, part three of three, pricing and estimating. And again, thank you both to the B&H event space and to Sony for having me here. Without both of them, it wouldn't be happening. Um, as I have said with the other two parts, and I'll say again, the business of photography is a big topic. We broke it up into three one hour sessions, which is really just dipping a toe in the water. It's not comprehensive, uh, but hopefully it's enough that it can get you started and can help you figure out what to look for next. In addition to being an artist of imagery, I'm also a man Frodo ambassador and x right Colorado and the APA national presidents. Those of you who've seen me before know all this. I primarily shoot people in portraits, uh, editorial corporate and advertising. And I say this in almost all of them, now is an exciting time to be a photographer. With the business of photography, there are things that are challenging about now because so many people are able to become, put their shingle up as a professional photographer. Whereas in the past, when I started in the late nineties, it was more challenging with film and just what was available to us, the barrier to entry was higher. So there were fewer people trying to be professional photographers. Some people talk about those days. Everybody always talks about the good old days. Usually the good old days are really the best in retrospect and not in the moment. Now, there's so many more places that use photography. There's so many more uses for the imagery that we create. Video is more open to all of us. And with the technology available to us, we can do incredible things. I switched to digital in the early 2000s because every time I did a test shoot for myself, I was spending two, three, four hundred dollars on film and processing. And by buying a digital camera, I got rid of all those expenses. Now you can get something like the 6400, the Alpha 7 III. They're amazing cameras. They're better than 35 millimeter film. The features they have just blow away everything that used to be available to us. Right now there's a special on the 7 III. It's $300 off, great camera. The tools we have are incredible. What we're able to do with photography is incredible. The way we'll, we're able to learn and experiment is amazing. And the fact that anybody watching this can decide they want to sh be a professional photographer of some level, whether it's full-time or part-time, is fantastic. It doesn't have to be something that is impossible because you can't afford to spend the time to put in. With digital, you can experiment, you can try, you can, ex you can play, and you can make it happen. I'm not saying all of you can, are necessarily going to become full-time professional photographers, but maybe you shoot a few things a month. Maybe you shoot a few things a year. Maybe you do go full-time. All right. There's still this, the uh, special sale on Sony lenses. Some lenses up to $200 off, including some of the G Masters. You can see everything that's on sale in Alpha Universe, or you can just go to the B&H uh, site and it will reflect all those prices. There's some great, great, great lenses. 200 to 600 great lens, 24 to 105 is on my camera almost all the time. It's the lens on the camera that's pointed at me right now. 2470 GM, 24 GM, there's a lot of great lenses. All right, the business of photography, pricing and estimating. So before we start, or as we're starting, just to be clear, one of the things about being a freelance photographer is that Every person who is a freelance photographer is their own business. Businesses can't collude on pricing. Even though sometimes pricing ends up being the same, like all the airlines can't get in a room together and say, we're going to charge $500 for a flight from JFK to LAX. We all agree on that. That's illegal. It's price fixing. Photographers, it's the same thing. We can't, as a group, agree on pricing. Um, I can't tell you what to charge. We can't do collusion. However, we can talk about this is what I have charged in the past. This is what I think. We just can't agree on pricing. And of course, 
every situation is different. We're all different. So even if we said every photograph of an apple should be $750, that wouldn't even make sense because sometimes it should be more and sometimes it should be less. Just getting that out there. All right. With pricing and estimating, as we've discussed before, there's sort of two kinds of professional photography. There's business to consumer and business to business. Business to consumer is wedding photography, family portrait photography, you know, actors' headshots, things like that. Business to business is photographing for a magazine or a company for their website or for their advertising, that kind of thing. And they sort of fall into two different categories as to how they're priced and what you do. We'll talk about them a little. My experience is much more in commercial photography, business to business. So I'll be talking more about that, but I will be discussing some of the other things uh, about business to consumer as well. We're going to be sort of talking about the cost of doing business, uh, expenses, usage. We'll explain what that is and just what do I charge? You as a photographer have to come up with something, right? Are you this photographer or that photographer? For example, right now, you can buy the Sony 600 millimeter F4 G master lens for $13,000. Although it looks like it's back ordered a little. Amazing lens, a fantastic lens, really, really a great lens. You could also buy the 200, 600, 56 to 63 G lens for $2,000. $2,000, $13,000, it's a big price difference. You can be the photographer who, these are both still great lenses, the $2,000 lens photographer, the $13,000 lens photographer. There's reasons for both. If you shoot sports professionally, you probably need that 600 F4. If you just occasionally need a long lens, the 200 to 600 might be just fine. It's going to depend on who you are and what you do. It's the same thing with photographers. Are you category A, less expensive? Maybe you do more projects. Category B, more expensive, you do fewer projects. That's all something you'll have to figure out and you may have to experiment and see, but think about that. One of the first things that's often brought up and I'm bringing it up now is when you're thinking about pricing, you have to think about your cost of doing business. What does it cost you to be in business? What does it cost to keep the lights on, to have your equipment, all of that? So what are your monthly expenses to be in business? And you need to add a salary. It's pretty hard to be a professional photographer if you're not making a profit. Some possible monthly expenses, cameras and other photo equipment, lights, lenses, flashes, bags, gray cards, more lenses, more cameras, all of that, right? You have to spend a certain amount of money to maintain and invest in your gear every year. You've got marketing expenses, you got the other equipment that we talked about. You've got insurance. You have a website and your web presence. You have utilities. If you have an office or a studio, travel expenses, your salary, all that stuff and more. I mean, that's just some of it. There's a lot of categories. Once you start uh, filing your Schedule C, you'll see there's a lot of categories. Then there's also project specific expenses that you might be able to bill to the client travel, assistance, makeup artist, stylist, equipment rental, studio rental. If you don't have a studio, producer, meals, retouching, insurance. Sometimes insurance gets billed per project. Sometimes you have it uh, all the time. Sometimes it's a combination of both. All of that needs to come into play. The expenses that you bill to the client aren't part of your initial cost of doing business because those expenses only exist if you have a shoot, if you have a job. They don't exist if you don't. That's how you differentiate them. The expenses that you need to pay every month, even if you don't do any photo projects, you need to factor in the ones that come up as a case by case get factored in in a different way. So the simple formula is take your monthly expenses, <clears throat> add whatever your salary will, should be, divide it by the number of working days, the number of assignments, and that will equal the minimum fee that you can charge to uh, profitably be a professional photographer. So for example, you might have $2,000 in expenses 
$4,000 monthly in salary. So that would get you to $4,800, $48,000 a year. That's not a ton of money. If you're in New York, it's really not a ton of money. Some places it might be fine, but $2,000 in expenses, $4,000 in salary. If you do six assignments a month, so one and a half a week, if you charge $1,000 in assignment, that's, that's what gets you there. Maybe you think $1,000 in assignment is too much. <clears throat> For the same amount, $2,000 in expenses, $4,000 in salary. If you do 20 assignments a month, you can charge $300 each. The thing to think about here is, and I do not suggest you charge $300. I think that's much too low. 20 assignments a month means that you're doing a project every working day of the month. There's about 20 working days, Monday through Friday, it's five times four weeks, it's 20. One assignment every working day of the month to make this work. That is a lot. I don't know anybody who works that much. And then you have a couple of days where you don't work, everything's thrown off. It's important to keep all of that in mind. Of course, maybe you wanna make $100,000 a year and do less work, 2,000 expenses, 8,000 a month, four assignments a month, $2,500. One of the potential flaws with this formula, and I do think it's a good place to start, is really, especially in that salary, but also in the expenses. If you think that you need all of the most expensive everything, you need to buy the new, you know, most expensive strobes that are $11,000 or $13,000 a pack. You need the 600 F4 just in case, but maybe you won't need it. Like, so you ha just have a huge amount of expenses as that goes up. And then you decide you wanna make 100,000 or 200,000 a year. So you're like, okay, so that's 16,000. I'm gonna charge $10,000 in assignment, shoot four times a month. That may not be realistic for what you do. It might be. There are people who do that and, and better for sure. But you have to think about just because this formula exists doesn't mean that the number it gives you is the right number. You may have to cut expenses or take a lower salary to make it work, uh, especially because you may not have the volume of assignments that you need to make it work. So just keep that in mind. It's not a magic formula where if it says this, then you charge that and it just happens. You may have to adjust and adapt so bear that in mind. All right. So when you're thinking about expenses and fees, is it all in one or separate? So we talked a little bit about the expenses that are recurring. They happen every month, whether you have an assignment or not. And then the expenses that only happen if they're a project. Sometimes with jobs, someone will say, I have $3,000. So that $3,000 includes everything. It needs to include all your expenses, all your fees, everything. That would be all in one as opposed to fees plus expenses. Most of the projects I do are here's the fee and then we add expenses on top of that and we agree on what those expenses will be ahead of time. And we'll get into more detail about that later. One of the challenges of doing pricing and estimating is there isn't really a super linear way to do it and still explain things. So it may feel like we're jumping around a little because we are. So there's everything, flat 3,000, flat 5,000, flat 10,000, whatever it is, or instead of 3,000 flat, here's 1,500 plus your expenses. And you may look at that and say 3,000 sounds better than 1,500 plus expenses, but maybe you've got 2,500 in expenses. So if you do the flat 3,000, you're only making $500, where if you took the 1,500 plus expenses, you're billing 4,000 and netting 1,500. You really have to think about it whenever it's an all-in-one price or an all-in-one fee, which is usually something the client dictates, really be careful to understand what it's going to cost you to produce. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But it can be, it can get dangerous. This is a common question. Should pricing be listed on your website? Maybe. I think for most commercial photographers, uh, you probably shouldn't. For most business to consumer photographers, it's worth considering. If you're a wedding photographer, 
a lot of wedding photographers have their prices listed on their website. If you do family portraits, if you photograph headshots, a lot of that is on people's websites in part because it allows you to filter out the people who can't afford you. If your pricing says $1,000 for a headshot on your website, everybody who goes to your website and thinks a headshot should be $200 isn't going to call you. That's good because you don't want the people that only have $200 to call you because it's a waste of their time and it's a waste of your time. But somebody who has 800 might not call you as well. And maybe if they did call you, you can explain why you're worth 1000 and get that. So it can be tricky. A lot of people use it as just a pre-screener to make sure that they don't have to deal with the people that are just a waste of time for everybody, including the person calling. With business to business, I think it rarely is a good idea to put pricing on your website, mostly because every project is different. Even with business to consumer, every project can be somewhat different, but it can be a little more formulaic. If you photograph weddings and you say, my wedding price includes eight hours of coverage, one album, uh, and only local travel, one assistant, and it's $6,000, that can be consistent because a lot of weddings will fall into that. With a commercial assignment, there's so much variety that putting prices up can be a little bit of a disservice because it's going to be challenging for people for that to fit what people need. And so someone could look at it and say, well, that's not what I want and move along. Or they could look at it, think it's what they want, but it really isn't what they need. And that needs to be part of a bigger conversation. So I, for example, do not put pricing on my website because every project is different. Uh, I occasionally have people that ask me for what my rates are. And then I always have to say, what is it that you need? We'll talk about that in a little bit too. As an example of what some people do have on their websites, I did a little Googling. Uh, here's some examples. Wedding photographer, $8,795, which includes travel, one album, and wedding day coverage. Somebody else is $1,899 for eight hours of coverage, which includes the digital files, $1,299 for a photographer plus a videographer for four hours, plus an album, plus a video. That same team is uh, $41.99 for two photographers, plus a videographer, plus three albums, plus a video, plus all the photos. So you can see there's a huge range. We Before we talked about, are you the $13,000 600 millimeter lens or the $2,000 200 to 600? Both excellent lenses. I have the 200 to 600, love it, it's a great lens. If I shot sports all the time, I would want the 600 to uh, F4. There's a huge amount of range. And there's room for all this range to exist. There are people who see that 8795, and there is no way, never in a million years, are they going to be able to afford to spend that. That's fine. There's also a photographer that will bring up a videographer for $1,299. I'm not sure how they do that. That seems low to me, but presumably they figured out a way to make it work. Different prices work for different people and in different environments, and you're going to get different clients with those prices. In my experience, the clients with the least money are the hardest to deal with, and the clients with more money are the easiest to deal with. If only we could just always get the clients with more money. Headshot photographers, 750, three looks, three images. 600, two looks, two images. That's sort of in line. 1500 plus $200 per selected image, 375 for one image. So that 1500 is a little bit of an outlier. It's a much well known, much more well-known name. These are the kinds of things though, where it makes sense to put it on your website. I think if someone's looking for headshots, headshots are what headshots are, right? It's a tight portrait of someone. It follows a formula. You know what you're going to get. There's less variety having that price on there can make sense. Then you get into something like fine art, which is just all over the place. $186 for a 20 by 30 uneditioned. Uneditioned means that if a thousand people order that print, they'll print a thousand. If 10,000, they'll print 10,000. If one, they'll print one. There is no limit on the number of uh, images that are printed. An edition is 
I will only print 25 of this plus sometimes one or two artist proofs. And once 25 of those are printed at 22 by 30, it never gets printed again. Typically in fine art, edition prints are going to make you a lot more money. Uh, even though most edition prints don't sell out their editions, and according to some things I've read, most edition prints sell more copies than non-editions because of the perception of rarity. So if you have an edition of 25, maybe you sell 20. If it's unedditioned, maybe you sell 10. Of course, again, every situation is different. Every photographer is different. Somebody watching may have had a different experience. It's all fine. It's just something to be aware of that in general, this is how it works. Nothing is 100% all the time. $43 for an 11 by 15 unedditioned, 125 for a 20 by 30 unedditioned, 860 for a 20 by 30 edition of 25, 4,210 for a 31 by 31 edition of 10. Does it make more sense to just print everything in an edition of 10 and sell it for $4,000? It might, but your potential market is smaller. You know, there's only a certain number of people that are going to pay $4,000 for that print. Are there 10 of them? Maybe. The person selling for $43, I feel like that's probably underpriced too. Uh, just your expenses in dealing with it, I I'm, I'm, don't really see how you can make any money off that, but hopefully they are. If they sell 1,000 of those, that's the same amount of money as this other person selling 10. There's a range, but they might have a better shot at selling 1,000 than they would trying to sell 10 of them at 4,200. It just varies. Fine art is tricky. Um, I think more so than almost anything else because it's just based on the perception of the value of it and whether or not people know who you are and how they feel about you. It's a, it's a strange business. All right. So let's start with or continue with getting the call. So somebody calls you, somebody emails you. They say, hey, how much for a photo shoot? I've gotten those calls. I've gotten those emails. You have to ask questions. How much for a photo shoot? There's no way to answer that in an effective way for what they need because you don't know what it is that they want a photo shoot of. You don't know what they need. When they say a photo shoot, do they mean one headshot of one person or do they mean a hundred headshots of 100 people in five cities over five days. Those are two different prices. There's no way to know when someone just says, how much is a photo shoot without asking questions. So ask questions, ask a lot of questions. Do you want to be, it's the same thing, which as I said, we'll cover uh, in a few weeks. What lens do you want? I need a lens, okay. There's a lot of lenses. Here's eight. Are you, do you want the 135 GM for $2,000? Do you want the 16 to 50 APS-C for $300? What is it that you need? These are the questions you have to ask. If you go into B&H and you say, I need a lens, they're going to have to ask you questions to give you the right lens, to sell you the right lens. They're not just going to say, okay, here's one. You walk out, oh, I didn't realized that I didn't need the 100 to 400. What I really wanted was a 1635 GM. Without someone asking questions, you can't give them an answer. You can't service the client. And ultimately, as commercial photographers or professional photographers, our job is to give the client what they need to help them solve their problem and make their lives easier to give them that picture that's going to make them happy for the rest of their lives because they've got their family to help them market their product, whatever it is, our job is to help them solve that problem. So we have to ask questions so that we understand what their problem is. One of the first questions I ask is always, what do you have a budget in mind? About half the time, they'll say, no, we don't have a budget in mind. We're just trying to get pricing. I would say of that half, almost always they do have a budget in mind. They just don't want to tell you because they feel like it puts them at a disadvantage in negotiating. If someone has $10,000 and they say, 
you they have ten thousand dollars, then you price out something, it's ten thousand dollars. They feel like maybe they could have gotten it for nine thousand dollars or six thousand dollars. That could be, but um, often if you have a sense of the budget, you can figure out the best way to solve their problem. And that's one of the things I will tell people when I ask what the budget is, is there's more than one way to deal to do this. If I have a sense of your budget, it will help me understand how the best way to approach it is, right? Is that we have a makeup artist, a makeup artist assistant, a stylist, a stylist assistant, a really nice studio, two assistants, a digital tech, really great catering, or is it we're renting the cheapest studio we can find and everybody's coming in makeup ready and it's bare bones. They're very different ways to do it. And if you know what the budget is, you can cater to that. I had a project that I was reached out to where they said, we don't have a budget in mind. It was to photograph either one person, two people or three people on a recurring basis at a university. Um, I spent a huge amount of time. I gave them three estimates. One was for one, two or three people, different pricing if it's one, two or three, two estimates, not three. Um, with high production, I'm bringing an assistant, I'm bringing lights, all this stuff. The second one was same number of people, just me, just bringing speed lights that I bounce off of a wall, super bare bones. Here are your choices. Option A, option B. We'll talk about giving them choices in a bit. And then they said, well, the last guy charged us $170. I couldn't do it for that. I spent a lot of time and they wasted a lot of time answering questions and dealing with me because they didn't want to communicate their budget. If they had told me that they had $170, I would have said, you might consider reaching out to some students. I can give you some names if you'd like. That is a way to solve their problem. I couldn't do it for that amount of money. And because they didn't want to share that, they wasted time and I wasted time. That happens a lot, uh, but it's never not frustrating. All right, so what is the budget? What is the project? Really, those should be the other way around. Meaning, is it, it's a picture of five headshots of, C, of the executive team, and then we need you to go around the factory floor and shoot a bunch of pictures. That's the project. Okay, so five headshots. Do you just need one of each? Okay. How many shots on the factory floor do you need? All of that needs to be factored in. When does the project need to be done by? What's the deadline? What's the timing? How will it be used? We'll talk about usage in a little bit. Do you need retouching? Uh, if they say yes, how much retouching? Do you want light retouching? Do you want extensive retouching? And then you have to, I put in that price for each individual photo. So each select, let's say it's, light retouching, $50 an image, hypothetically. If you have 10 selects, $50 times 10. If you have 100 selects, $50 times 100. It's per image when I typically do it. Do you need a makeup artist? If it involves models, who's paying the models? Generally, if I can, I will have the models bill directly to the client so I don't have to deal with it. But all of that has to factor in before you can think about even beginning to come up with a price, and then so much more, so much more. If you have a project where it's big and scary and seems like a much bigger deal than you know how to deal with, there are people who can help you. Years ago, I had somebody call me for a DVD release of a TV show that they wanted to shoot in the subway on the Brooklyn Bridge. It was four shots. The lots of usage, lots of expenses. I had a little bit of a panic attack because I didn't even know how to approach it. So I called the producer I knew who helped me with the estimate. So if it's a big project, there are producers. A producer is someone who helps. They can help you with the estimate. They can help you put together the whole job. They produce the job. So they'll help you find the studio or maybe find the studio. They'll deal with hiring all the talent, with dealing all the crew, catering, all of that. They help handle all of that so you can focus on getting the best pictures possible. Producers, if you're, if they know you and they have confidence in you, 
you can usually call a producer to help you with an estimate and typically they'll do it at no cost because if they do and everything works out, they get the job and they charge by the day. If it's someone who's never heard of you, if you're super green, they may charge you to do the estimate because it's a lot of work for them. Depending on what it is, they may have to call a bunch of people, put all these things on hold, you know, find studios. It's a lot of work and they want to be compensated for it. It makes sense. We don't get compensated for doing estimates, but the upside for us is higher than it is for a producer typically. There are also pricing and estimating services. Wonderful Machine will do it. I think Agency Access will do it. There are others. Um, Frank Mayo will do it where you pay a fee. Sometimes it's a fee plus a percentage of the job if you get it. And they will help you price, uh, price out the job, estimate the job, and sometimes negotiate if you get some back and forth from the client. There are reps. So reps or agents are people whose job it is to represent a photographer. There are a lot fewer good reps than there are good photographers who want reps. I, for example, don't have a rep, um, but I would like to have a rep. Um, their job is to be the go-between and help with the estimating, help market you, help promote you, talk to the art producer so that you don't have to, talk about pricing so that you don't have to. Uh, if you know reps, they can help you with this too. There's a lot of reps that will help you on an ad hoc basis. So while they may not represent you regularly, you may not be on their roster. If you call them up and say, I have this project, it looks like it's happening, can you help me? They will help you for a percentage. If you're on the roster, it's usually 25 or 30% of fees, not expenses. Um, if you're not on the roster, it varies. And then of course, colleagues. One of the best things about photography is the community. So if you have a project and you're not sure what to do, call other photographers you know and ask them. Call them up and say, hey, I've got this, this job that somebody asked me about. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Does $2,000 seem high? Does $2,000 seem low? What am I missing? The more people you reach out to, the better it will help you make sure you don't miss anything. And one of the most important things when you're estimating is you do not want to miss anything. You don't want to forget that you need a makeup artist and it's a beauty shoot because when the client's looking at that, they're going to say, we're not going to hire this person. They weren't smart enough to hire a makeup artist. Part of that estimate is to show that you understand what's involved in the production and you're including everything. <clears throat> Obviously with smaller jobs, it's less of an issue. There are plenty of shoots I do where there is no makeup artist. There's me or me an assistant and the art director and it's super easy, minimal expenses, but you know, there's jobs so I've done where there's $25,000 in expenses. It just depends on the project. And that the ones with high expenses, if you don't have everything in there, an educated client is going to see that and it's going to be a red flag. And usually if you're in an estimating stage on something like that, you're rarely the only photographer estimating. Uh, if it's an ad job, there might be two or three. And so they're going to look at everything. And if you miss something, they know and, and they're not going to be happy about it. So they just won't call you back. All right. So if you're in a situation where they're not clear, they haven't told you what the budget is, offer them options. So do you want the Sony Zeiss 35 millimeter 2.8? Do you want the 35 millimeter 1.8 for APS-C? Do you want the 35 GM? Do you want the 35 Zeiss 1.4? Do you want the 35 1.8? There's five different 35 millimeter lenses here. They're all 35 millimeters. The focal length is the same. They're all different. They cost different amounts. They serve different purposes. Some are smaller, some are bigger, some are sharper. They all serve different things. Now, if someone isn't clear on what they want, I will give them choices. Like I mentioned with that university, I will say, okay, we have the 35 millimeter 2.8 Sony Zeiss. It's $800, this is what you get for it. Or we have the 35 millimeter 1.4 GM it's $1,400, this is what you get with it. And you allow them to make the decision because they almost always have a budget, even though they didn't tell you. And if you give them something that fits in that budget, you're more likely to get the project. Uh, do keep in mind, you need to make sure that 
whatever numbers you're putting out there, you feel good about that you can explain and justify. You don't want a situation where someone says, my budget is $500 and you say, no problem. You have to make sure that you can successfully do the job and do the job well and feel good about it for that budget. Uh, I saw a photographer named Norman Jean Roy speak several years ago who mentioned in pricing, every time he gets called for a job, he either needed to be paid a lot of money or it needed to be an amazing picture for his portfolio. If it was both, that was fantastic. If it was neither, he would walk away. You will find people that will say, if you just do this one for me, next time we'll call you when there's a bigger budget. That is almost never true. Usually, if you are the person who photographs something for the low budget, you're who they call when they have a low budget. And then when they have a higher budget, they call the photographer who's the high budget photographer because the perception is they're better, right? It's the same thing if you want a Lamborghini or do you want a old 1980s Fiero? The Lamborghini has the perception of being better than the Fiero, even though they'll both get you to the grocery store. Although the Fiero might be better for the grocery store because you can put more groceries in it. But so give people choices. Low production, low usage, medium production, medium usage, high production, high usage. I will sometimes find that clients will go for the highest of the choices because the perception is it's the best one. And it, I mean, it is in a lot of ways because it has the most crew and the most, just everything is there. But don't always assume they're gonna go for the lowest choice. Sometimes they'll go for the highest choice, especially if, if you're photographing someone who's important at a company. All right, so let's talk about usage a little bit. Usage is how is that photo going to be used? Is it for personal use or commercial use? If it's a wedding, for example, it's probably personal use, right? They're not gonna be using it to market their candle business. They just got married. It's going to you know their parents or their grandparents or their kids or their family. Commercial use is we're gonna put it on a billboard. One of the things with usage is where will it be used and for how long? Uh, I just had a call with somebody to help them price something where they initially said they wanted a buyout, which means different things to different people. To me, what it means is everything forever, always. The problem with that is that usually people don't really need everything forever, always. So it turns out they only needed pictures for the United States, for example. So the usage wasn't worldwide, but a buyout says we want everything. If it's worldwide, it's more money. If it's just the United States, it's less. If it's just New York State, it's less. If it's just New York City, it's less. As you make where it's used smaller, the price comes down. As it goes bigger, the price goes up. You use something more, it costs more. So talk about usage. Where will it be used and for how long? Is it for a month, a year, 10 years, forever? Um, one thing with usage too is that sometimes you'll have clients who for whatever reason <clears throat> don't want you to be able to use the picture or show the picture. So I have clients, um, I used to shoot for a drug and alcohol rehab nonprofit. I can't show those pictures to anyone because of HIPAA rules, which is patient privacy rules. So I have all these pictures I really like that I can't show. There's other clients who, for whatever reason, won't let people show things. Pharmaceutical clients often won't let you show the work. Sometimes you can't even talk about the work. If it's in one of the situations, you want to try and get more money because if I take an amazing picture, I can't use it to get other work. I need to be compensated more. Bear that in mind and make sure that this is all part of the conversation. And don't lower your price for no reason. So. If you come in and it's $2,000 and they say, well, we have $1,200 and you say, okay. It in part says that your $2,000 wasn't based on anything. If they have $1,200, then look at what concession, what can change that will justify lowering the price. Maybe they pay you faster. Maybe they give you a hundred copies of their t-shirt, maybe, you know, there's different things. They give you five free meals at the restaurant, whatever it is. If they only have $1,200, think about what can be done so that they still only pay $1,200, assuming that you can make that work. 
but what else can happen to make up that difference so it doesn't look arbitrary? And also so that next time when you say $2,000, they pay you $2,000 or $5,000 or whatever. But don't just lower the price to lower the price. And when you're discussing budget too, keep in mind that when someone says they have a lot of money or a little money, if they don't give you numbers, that means different things to different people. I had an ad agency call me to photograph a display in a store and they said we don't have much of a budget and to me when someone says at the time especially when someone says they don't have much of a budget i thought maybe they had five hundred dollars they had five thousand dollars and then it ended up not happening anyway so it didn't matter but to them not much of a budget because it was an ad agency was five thousand dollars but so they bring their perceptions you bring your own perceptions you don't want to assume that your perceptions are the same as theirs. So try and find out what that number is. I was like, yeah, I can make $5,000 work. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but all right. So now let's get into estimating. Estimating is going to happen with commercial photography. It's not really typically going to happen with business to consumer photography. If you're photographing a wedding, it's typically here's what the price is. Estimating is you saying, this is how much I think the project will cost. You're going to put in project specific expenses, same list we had before, travel, assistance, digital tax, makeup artists, wardrobe stylist, PAs, producer, equipment rental, studio rental, meals, retouching, insurance, all that stuff, whatever is relevant. Obviously, don't put stuff in there that isn't. There are things that can help you figure it out. So there's a software called PhotoQuote that you can plug in usage and it will help you figure out your fees. There's software called BlinkBid. Uh, I use both of these. I don't have relationships directly with them, but I do know Lou Lesko who, has Blink, who owns BlinkBid and he's a great guy. Both of those are pieces of software that can help you with your estimating and it can help you make sure you don't miss anything. And then when you're putting it together, you wanna to be specific about everything. Absolutely everything. I did an assignment years ago where we just talked about it. Everything was fine. We agreed on a price. And then because we were ahead of schedule, they added a whole bunch of shots. It ended up being way more work. But because I hadn't been specific about it, because we hadn't written everything down in a clear way, I wasn't really in a position that I felt like I could change, that I could change the terms because to that client, they were within the terms because we hadn't been clear. So be specific about everything. So a photo, it's five photographs of five people with two selects each on this day, at this place, whatever it is, so that they don't assume they're coming to your studio that you don't have because you didn't put down a studio because you didn't talk about it. You want to be specific about everything. Here's an example of an estimate I did for a project that did happen. Um, Spells out the license. They had very broad license. Spells out what my expenses are, an assistant, a digital tech, a makeup artist, the retouching, lighting rental. I had to travel, so hotel, meals, car rental, uh, renting a monitor, all that stuff. They paid in advance. Um, there's cancellation fees because they postponed it at the last minute. That's another reason to have everything in writing. If you can get a contract, like BlinkBed will put in a contract, you can write up your own. If you get an attorney, don't write up your own, get an attorney. Um, what happens if someone calls you the morning you're, as you're driving to the assignment and says, ah, oh, you know what, we need to push it a week. If you haven't written everything down, if you haven't agreed ahead of time on what that means, you could be in a bad position. So we did, I didn't charge them a cancellation fee for myself. But I did, you know, I had to pay my crew, I had to pay my assistant, my digital tech and my makeup artist, because they shouldn't lose out on a day of work because it was canceled at the last minute. It's not fair to them because they could have booked something else. There are, uh, in the resources, which are the same as the last two weeks, uh, things like the Wonderful Machine Photographer's Blog, member blog, has a ton of estimates that they've done and they explain why the pricing is what it is and why the expenses are what it is. Uh, and I know we're rushing through, but again, like I said at the beginning, there's only so much time. Uh, 
A common thing now with bigger projects are treatments. It started out in film and television and video. Treatments are, whoops, treatments are sort of a document that you include with the estimate to explain how you see the project, what the timeline is. You might include example photos, just how you envision everything coming together along with the estimate. So that when they're looking at you and two or three other photographers, they can say, oh, well, Danny, the way he's going to approach it, you know, he's got this really cool idea. He really gets it. We get it. He sounds great. This other person, they don't really seem to understand it. They're less expensive, but we're not sure they're going to do it right. A, a treatment helps you explain why your, uh, why your estimate is what it is, why you might be more expensive, and why it's the right amount of money. Uh, not every project needs it, <clears throat> and it can be a lot of work and a lot of time, but it can really make a big difference. Uh, all right, and then you have rights and copyrights. Like we said before, get everything in writing. It protects you and it protects the client. I've seen a lot of things where photographers are like, you know, this client used this picture. That wasn't what we agreed to. Did you have a contract? No. If somebody uses a picture outside the scope of what you thought you agreed to, if you didn't write it down, it could be easily a misunderstanding. It could be, well, we thought we could use it for this. Well, I didn't say that, but you did not not say it. You want everything spelled out. And it also protects the client so that you are delivering what they need so that everybody understands it's a meeting of the minds. Whether or not you want to do a full contract or just an email saying, this is what we're doing, just something that you can refer back to so that everybody understands. And sometimes when you do it, they're like, oh, wait, you know, we said four, but we meant five. It gives you an opportunity to fix problems before they're problems. It's going to make life better for everybody. And then because there's nowhere else to really mention it, copyright, register your copyright. In the United States, when you photograph something, when you put something in tangible form that you create, you own the copyright. If I take a picture right now, that picture is mine, I own the copyright. However, you need to register the copyright with the copyright office to be able to do anything if someone infringes on that copyright. It also gets a lot more complicated. You need to register it in a timely manner. So if I photograph something today and register it in two years, but somebody infringes in a year, it really limits what you can do. You want to register in a timely manner. You go to copyright.gov. Under registration, they've got video tutorials. They've got a lot of information. The process is not as smooth as it should be. It's one of the many things that APA, which I mentioned I'm the national president of, and the other photo trade organizations, we communicate with the Copyright Office, and we're trying to make it better and easier for everyone. In some ways, it's gotten better over the years. Like, you can do it online now. There was a time when, with published work, you couldn't do group registration. Uh, but there's still a lot of things that could be better, and we're trying. All the trade organizations are trying. So register your copyright. <clears throat> There's video tutorials, group registration of published photographs, unpublished, all that stuff. There is a fee. So you may have to balance how many pictures you register with what amount of money you can afford to spend. All right, some of the resources which we've talked about before, Sony's Alpha Universe. If you search on business, there's a ton of great information there, alphauniverse.com. APA's national website, apanational.org. You have a business manual, lots of other stuff. Wonderful Machines member blog. A photo editor has an agent list, a photography consultant list, lots of good information. Photo Shelter has tons of great guides. Uh, the APA business manual, John Harrington's best business practices for photographers, Maria Piscopo's marketing book. APANational.org, ASMP, NPPA, PPA, all great trade organizations. Obviously, APA is the best, but they're all good. All right. Let's see if there's any questions. And my, my website's there. You can find me. All right, Tony. Thank you so much. That was a ton of great information. Um, I know I took away a bunch from that, even for, you know, for my own stuff. So I hope everybody else did as well. Um, 
we have a I couple questions. Try. Yeah, we have a couple questions that came in. So let's, uh, let's see if we can get to those. So we'll start with, um, with Hayden on Facebook. He's, uh, he says, speaking about fine art, what's a good measure to tell whether you are priced out of the market or if you need to market it better? Uh, well, so there's, there's two things. Everyone should always market better without question. No matter how good you are at marketing, you can market better. Um, in terms of pricing out of the market, I would experiment maybe with a smaller size that's dramatically cheaper and see if it makes a big difference. So let's say you do editions of 10, 20 by 30s at $1,000 and they're just not selling. Maybe you could do an edition of $50 and see if that sells. If it does, there's a market for your work. If it doesn't, everything you're doing needs to change and you need to figure out where that market is. That's something that you might try. Um, Fine art is hard. I mean, almost no one makes a full-time living from fine art photography. There's a lot of fine art photographers that teach or do other things. So it's hard. Um, if prints are selling, you're doing it right. If they're not, you either need to find your market or lower the pricing and then increase it. With addition prints as well, uh, people will often increase the price as the addition goes on. So again, let's say you have 10, 20 by 30s, maybe the first two are 500 but the last two in that edition are $2,000. And as more of them sell, you increase the price. I hope that was helpful. Awesome, yeah. And we have another question, a, a little bit related to that from Michelle, uh, you know, about uh, fine art photography. So Michelle wants to hear more about how a fine art photographer should sell or price. She says, everyone thinks my art is lovely and it wins awards and is juried into shows, but I'm not making enough. Fine art is so hard to price. It really is. Um, it, assuming that you don't have a gallery, uh, what you might consider is, uh, I think last week, we, uh, which should be up on Facebook, right? And yeah, on YouTube yeah. At some point. Last week's uh, episode uh, should be up. Yep. I mentioned uh, a handful of places that fine art photographers can can list their work online and sell it. If I were really pushing hard for fine art, what I would do is sign up for two or three of those. And I would list different work at different prices, but similar sizes and additions. So the 20 by 30s on this site are $500. The 20 by 30s on this site are 750. The 20 by 30s on this site are 1,000. Different images, because you don't want it to look like the same image is priced differently. But a similar body of work and see which site is selling better, if any, and which uh, price point seems to be the sweet spot. And then as you get more well-known, you can increase it, but it's, it's difficult. Fine art is difficult. And bringing the price too low doesn't make any sense. I mean, it costs you a certain amount of money to create the work, the time, the effort, the experience, all of that stuff. It's just like commercial photography. You still have to pay for the equipment. And then You've got to print it. You've, it's got to be a beautiful print. Like all of that takes time. So you don't want to come down too low because it's just not worth it. But I would do an AB test or an ABC test with different sites at different price points and see if you get any information from that. I hope that. Yeah, that, that's no, that's great advice for, you know, testing the market. I, I think that's great. Um, Deborah is asking, what do you do when a client is unhappy and wants a reshoot? Uh, corporate or private portrait, but it would cost you a lot of money to bring crew back a second day. So she's saying, meaning you think that you hit the mark, but they are complaining. Would that be something that you were, I know you address, you know, contract stuff. So you want to touch on that? Yeah. First, let me say that's awful. I, I had a client who I did everything they wanted. I sent them the pictures and they're like, yeah, we don't really love it. And it just, it's like a gut punch. It, Oh, it's just an awful, awful feeling. No matter, doesn't matter that you did everything right. It still is just awful. Um, my opinion is you can't be out of pocket. Uh, so depending on the circumstances, if it's a situation where there was a clear misunderstanding and you were actually at fault, if you have errors in admissions insurance, that might help with that. Um, but if you don't, I would negotiate something where they perhaps... I mean, every situation is different, but where maybe they covered the expenses, but there's no fee to do a reshoot. 
if you feel like it's legitimate, some clients are just unreasonable. Um, but it is very much where hopefully there's a contract that spells it out. Um, it's also a situation where as much as possible, if you can, and I obviously, I don't know your circumstances, you want somebody approving things as you go. Like I will sometimes, if the client isn't there, uh, I'll use the Imaging Edge mobile and send pictures from my camera to my phone and text them or email them pictures as we're going so that they see exactly what we're getting. And they can say, yes, no, a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that. I mean, that doesn't help, you know, that's all hindsight stuff. But the, the best thing I would suggest is if you can, assuming it makes sense, is approach it as we can reshoot, but they pay expenses and there's no fee. But I'm sorry you're in that situation. That's awful. That just, no matter who's, no matter how much the client's at fault, it's an awful feeling. Yeah. Definitely. And, and uh, oh, Helen um, is asking if you could, what's the name of that mobile app again? Uh, Imaging Edge Mobile is uh, an app that works with Sony cameras so that you can control the camera from your phone or your iPad, your tablet, uh, or you can transfer photos from your phone to your phone or tablet so that you can quickly send pictures to clients if you need to. Awesome. Now, Diana is asking if you can talk about insurance. Do you have any, any advice around that? Uh, a, a bit, yeah. So on the first one of these, we did talk about insurance. Um, so there might be more detail if you look at that. Uh, but there's essentially, there's three kinds of insurance, roughly. I mean, there's a million kinds of insurance. But for our purposes, there's three. There's liability insurance, which is what covers you if something goes wrong that you're responsible for, like your light stand falls over and breaks somebody's toe or sets their drapes on fire because the light you know, broke or something. Liability insurance, that covers that. So if you're responsible for something, it's paid for both because it's better for them to be made whole and so that they don't sue you into bankruptcy. Then there's errors and emissions insurance, which covers things that are like you forgot to get a model release or you thought you got a model release and it disappeared or uh, you photographed a bunch of stuff, you brought it back to the office, you put it on a hard drive, there was a power outage, everything got fried, all the pictures are gone. That's the kind of thing that errors and emissions insurance is for, where there was an error or an emission. Uh, and then there's equipment insurance, which is somebody steals your cameras, insurance for that. Um, liability insurance, many photographers have to have to function because there are a lot of places, a lot of locations that will not let you in as a photographer unless you have liability insurance. Um, equipment insurance is a good idea. Your homeowner's insurance probably won't cover it if you're a business. And errors and emissions insurance is the one that the fewest people I know have, um, but it's, I have it, it's like $50 a month, the policy I have. It's, well, that's not nothing. Just knowing it's there makes me feel enough better that fifty dollars a month is worth it. All right, Tony, thank you so much. I, that's that's all the uh, that's all the questions that came in. So it looks like we covered everything. Thank you so much for for joining us today, and thank you so much for a great series. We're looking forward to more of these. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, and uh, thank you to everybody for watching, and we'll see you next time at the B and H virtual event space.